Hi, and welcome to Bernina's Sewing Mastery Class 1 with Material Girls Quilt Boutique. Today we're going to start our lessons evolving around the sewing portion of your Bernina sewing machine. This class incorporates screens from the machines that you see listed here, as well as the information does pertain to other models of Bernina, the screens just may not match. Features and functions should be and can be found um, on those machines. So we are working in a course workbook. That workbook can be downloaded from our website, materialgirlsquilt.com. If once you're there, go to the header tab across the top that says Bernina University. And then from the drop down, choose sewing education. That there is a PDF file there that you can click to, to download. And there's also one there for other models. So pay attention to which uh, PDF you're downloading and make sure that it corresponds to the machine um, that you currently own. Today, we're going to start with covering information on setting the machine up for sewing threading the machine, both upper and lower thread, and then we're gonna talk about presser feet. First up is needles. <clears throat> Inserting a new needle every time you start a project is going to come in handy. It's going to guarantee that you're starting with the sharpest needle in the best quality that there is, and a new needle is usually going to solve a quite a big percentage of any issues that you may be having with your machine not sewing correctly. Now, in your workbooks, on pages 51 oops, and 52, there is a huge reference guide in reference to, a two-page reference guide in reference to sewing machine needles. Uh, there's a chart talking about the types of needles, the sizes they come in, and then additional information as to how or when to use which needle. For your machines, we are using a needle system of a 130-705H, which may make no sense to you, but if you're reading a package of needles, typically there is some sort of system number written on the package and you wanna make sure that it has that particular information. The 130-705H is a standard home in sewing needle just basically designates that the machine uses a flat back, it's a certain length and position and things like that. It's not so much any information that you may need to know, but if you put in a different needle on a different needle system, for example, there's a 705B, oops, that that information or that needle may not stitch correctly um, in your machine. Our Bernina machine needles have a flat back to them. They're going to go into the machine, the flat back away from you. You will insert them at the highest position and then tighten the needle screw. When you get into different types of needles, that the type being denim, top stitch, quilting, universal, it all relates to how the needle, um, the groove size, the eye of the needle and how sharp or I hate to say dull, but how sharp the point of that needle is. You want to um, make sure that you change your needle every four to six hours of sewing. Okay, so that's why we say you always want to start with a new project with a new needle. Okay, it'll just solve a lot of problems for you. Now, when we talk about size of needle, needles can be anywhere from a size 60 up to a size 120. Or it could be, you could see the numbers as like 60 slash 8 or 120 slash 18. Those numbers mean the same thing, just one is on a domestic and one is on a European scale. So it doesn't matter which number you reference, the lower the number, the finer the needle, okay? So as a needle size goes up, 
So a, a 70 needle is smaller and finer than a 110 needle, okay? Now, they also relate to when your needle goes up in size, typically we're also going to be going up in thread thickness. And we'll talk about thread in a moment. But what will change in my life size needle that you see here is the point on a needle will change based upon um, the type of needle. So like a universal needle is not a super sharp needle. It's sharp, but it's designed that you can kind of use it on all fabrics, whether it's a knit or a cotton a denim. When you get to like a quilting needle, the point of this is going to be very sharp on a quilting needle versus a ballpoint needle that's going to be slightly rounded for sewing on knits. There is a groove that runs up the front of the needle, okay? That groove size will change sizes based on the needle size and type because this groove needs to be either large enough or small enough or fit the thread that you're using perfectly. If this groove does not match your thread, you will get unsatisfactory stitch quality skip stitches, loop stitches, just in general, you're not gonna be happy. So that's going to make a difference when we get into needles. Now, <clears throat> I talk about uh, changing your needle every project. So what you see here on screen is the, at the very top is a needle brand new out of the package. And then down at the bottom is the, the needle about maybe eight hours or so after it's been used. So you can see that that point gets very, very dull. Now it may be sharp enough for you to still be able to sew through a finger or sew through fabric, but your machine is working harder to sew that stitch. It's poking a larger hole. It's working harder to, pay, to poke that hole. So. If you're having a lot of issues with the items that are listed there, broken thread, skip stitches, puckered, damaged fabric, uneven seams, a lot of that can relate back to a um, bad needle, okay? So you want to change your needle often. It is the easiest and least expensive way to fix the quality of your stitching. It is also the least expensive piece of equipment for your sewing machine that can cause the most monetary damage if it is not changed um, regularly. Okay. Let's talk about thread. Now, we tell you when we talk about thread, there to always use a high quality long staple thread the higher the quality and the longer staple threads are going to produce less lint, less spraying and breakage. On the YouTube channel, there is, I believe, I know there is, a, an entire chat about thread that you can watch um, at another time, but it goes into way more in-depth information about weights and sizes and things along that lines. We want to make sure that the weight of our thread and our needle size work together. If they don't work together, you're not going to get pretty stitching. We generally match thread, thread fiber to fabric content. So cotton to cotton, uh, man-made or polyester to polyester fabrics and things along that lines. Not only do you need to worry about the weight of the thread working with the size of the needle, but you also need to consider the weight of the thread in the weight of your fabric. So you don't want to be using a very fine, delicate thread. So a 60 weight thread is finer and thinner than a 40 weight thread. Okay, so the lower the number in weight in thread, the thicker it is. So it's opposite of the way that everything, other, everything else in the world works. So you want to make sure that you're not sewing a very thick fabric with a fine, delicate thread, and you're not sewing a very fine, delicate fabric with a thread that's really thick and dense because you're not going to be happy with the puckering or the gathering or the breakage 
and and um, that you're going to get with the that correlation between the two of them together. On page 53 of the workbook, you will find um, some reference information about thread and the weights of thread and things like that. Thread weight, again, goes anywhere from 12 weight all the way to, I've seen 100 weight. Your machines are tensioned and, and bobbin cases are tensioned for 40 to 50 weight thread. So do not feel that when you put in something thicker or thinner into your machine that you may have to make some attempt some changes or adjustments to tension. You are allowed to adjust the upper tension on the sewing machine. I would avoid doing too much adjusting on bobbin tension unless you have an 880 or an 830 or an 820 machine because we can easily return that to standard um, tension. But for those um, that operate, we operate with bobbin cases, you really want to avoid having to make any sort of tension adjustments to this case because you will not or have to spend a lot of time getting it back and ready for regular sewing. If you do a lot of work with one particular weight of thread, I would suggest that you come purchase another bobbin case and let us tension it for that particular weight of thread for you. That way you can always have one that's ready to go for maybe that 30 weight thread that you want to use and things along that lines. Um, our seven, our five and, well, four, five and seven series machines, these bobbin cases, we actually have two additional colors there is a gold colored bobbin case that has higher tension on it so that if you are, we use it mostly for embroidery, but if you're doing a lot of decorative stitching and finding your bobbin thread coming to the top, I would switch over to that case. And then we have a red bobbin case that is designed with no tension. The no tension bobbin case is what we use for doing a technique of bobbin work where we actually put the thick thread in our bobbin, we use fine thread on top, and we sew upside down with the right side of the fabric down towards the feed dogs. Whole nother class in itself. Okay. The other thing I wanted to take a look at is just in general um, in how a stitch is made. And before we look at that, I just wanted to cover one thing. And that is the way that thread is put onto a spool, okay? There are two ways that thread is put on a spool. One way being um, what we call stacked. And this thread that you see here on the screen now is what we call stacked thread. And there's not really, now it's also variegated, so it's hard to see, but there's not really any sort of pattern to it. It, lit it looks striped. So it is stacked one on top of the other to the top, and then it comes back down. Uh, most commonly, uh, stacked threads is pretty much anything by um, superior threads is going to be stacked. And Coates and Clark is also a stacked thread. The other way that thread is put onto a spool is going to be what we call crosswound. And so when you look at a crosswound thread, it kind of has this cross or zigzag style um pattern to it these particular threads uh you'll find are like arafil mettler guterman things along that lines are going to be what we call cross wound now the only difference between these two spools is beyond the way that they are wound on the the spool itself is going to be the way that we put them on the machine okay Threads that are stacked are going to operate best on the machine standing up. So most of us have, we have a vertical spool pin. It either um, pops up from the top or flips up from the back. You, everybody gets with Bernina gets um, these foam pads. You can take, you take a foam pad, you're going to drop it onto the, um, spool pin and then you're going to take your spool and set it on top and then you will follow the threading of the machine with the uh, thread standing up the cross wound thread 
is going to operate best laying down on the machine. However, cross wounds will work just fine, both up and laying down or standing up. This stack thread is really going to work best standing up. You're gonna get better tension, even tension, and better stitch quality if you stand them up on the machine. Okay, so that's really the only difference between the way that they're wound is the way that they're going to go onto the machine. Okay. So when we look at that groove, like I mentioned earlier about running down the front of the needle, that groove is there to hold your thread in place so that you can see how it is stitched. So if we watch this little video here. Here's how a sewing machine works. There's a threaded needle above the fabric. When it pierces the fabric, a rotating shuttle hook below catches the thread. As the hook spins, it spreads the needle's thread, looping it around a threaded spool called a bobbin. The two threads knot and form a stitch. So if that thread does not stay in this groove, it will not make the proper loop. Holding the pieces of fabric together. Okay. So it is, re it is important that the thread matches that groove because if it's not it won't be large the loop will not be large enough to be picked up in the hook or it will not be in the right place for the hook to grab and make a stitch okay let's talk about um preparing the machine for sewing and we're going to cover bobbin winding for a four five and seven series machine and then I will cover threading the machine for a four, five, and seven series machine. And then I will talk about my eight series machines. Um, you have a different way of threading and winding bobbins. So you see um, on the slide, we are going to um, put our spool on the machine, whether it's laying down or standing up, either one. We're going to bring the thread through the first path Underneath the back clip, we're going to come to the top silver dot, which is your bobbin winding tensioner. We're gonna travel clockwise around that tensioner and then come to our bobbin and then travel clockwise around our bobbin. We're gonna wrap a few times around the bobbin and then we cut our thread on the back. You do not need to thread a hole in that bobbin before it starts winding, okay? The middle of the bobbins are scored so that the thread will get caught and picked up as soon as it starts winding, okay? Actually threading one of the holes in the bobbin, there's those holes right there, can actually cause your, your lower thread sensors to um, give you some false errors, okay? So we don't need to do that. So I'm gonna thread here on the screen um, in the video here so I want to give you a little tip you're gonna put a spool cap on the machine that closely matches the size of the spool so you want to make sure that you're not using too small or too big of a spool cap I'm gonna hold the thread that's coming off of the spool in my right hand and I'm gonna hold the other end of the tail in my left hand I'm gonna put some tension on this I'm gonna come underneath this back first clip it is labeled with a number one. When we're winding bobbins, all of them are dotted lines that we're following. While I'm still holding some tension, I'm going to wrap around the bobbin tensioner and that's gonna allow the thread to pop in between the two pieces of metal. So if you put your finger in there, you can kind of feel it. I'm gonna travel over to the bobbin now the bobbin goes on the bobbin winder one way, okay? On my four, five, and seven series machines, there is, you have like a silver, and then you have a black side. Silver goes down on the machine. It actually won't fit the other way, so don't force it. Just flip it around. Wrap a couple of times, bring the thread over, and cut it on the back of the bobbin winding starter, and then you're gonna slide this over, okay? 
Wind until it's full. If it's full, it'll stop. If you don't want it to be full, just pull back and the bobbin winder will stop running. When it's you're finished, you can lift up and cut your thread on the back of the uh, bobbin winder, okay? And then you'll have your bobbin wound. And I'm gonna skip a couple screens, so bear with me for a second. Now, we'll come back to those for my eight series. Let's look at putting your bobbin into the bobbin case. So again, it only fits in the bobbin case one way, okay? So don't force it if it doesn't go. It goes shiny in. So once I have my thread in, I'm going to bring my thread tail to the slit, okay? In the side of the bobbin case, and then we're going to travel the thread up to this top little loop. And I'm gonna try to um, get a better picture. You have this loop that's here. Let me zoom in. Okay. We're gonna sweep the thread under that loop and then pull upwards so that we can get the thread to come out through the top. We want the thread to be caught in between that metal loop, okay? So if you look at the slide image, we're coming underneath this portion and then just pulling straight up. It kind of pulls it around the side. If you um, look, you're just sliding it underneath to get it to come around this side of it to pop inside, okay? Now, when we go to put the bobbin into the bo into the machine, <clears throat> you open your bobbin door. You're going to, um, if you need to eject your bobbin case, you're going to press the latch that lives at three o'clock, okay? So you'd press that and your bobbin case will come out at you. You're gonna repeat the process in reverse to return your bobbin case into the machine. And you wanna do so with not pressing at three o'clock. Because if you put your bobbin case in the machine and keep pressing at three, it's never going to latch in place, okay? So, um, oops, wrong button. Let's come here and let me move. Let me move this camera, but I don't want to do it where you're watching here because I'll make you ill. And let me get this set up. Lots of camera moving on this one, <clears throat> on this class. Okay, so I'm gonna take my bobbin case here and let the camera catch up. And I'm gonna insert it into the machine. And I'm gonna press anywhere but at um, three o'clock. Okay, Let's see if I can't get this camera to catch up with me here. Okay, so three o'clock is eject, bobbin pops out. When I wanna put the bobbin in, I'm just gonna kinda tilt it in, get it lined up with this being straight across at three o'clock, and then you can press. I usually press at six o'clock, and that will lock it into place. Okay, now, <clears throat> let's look at threading the upper portion of the four, five, and seven series machines, okay? So, <clears throat> with my four, five, and seven series machines, we are going to um, thread the upper half of the machine just like we did for bobbin winding. Let me get this in the right location here.
All right. We're going to thread the upper portion of the machine, just like we did earlier for bob and winding. We're going to come underneath this back clip, and then we're going to move straight forward and down, okay? I want you to be sure, again, that you're holding the back of this thread taut when you're coming forward. Because if you're not holding this tight enough and you just care, lightly lay this here, you actually won't hit the two upper tension discs. The, the thread will actually just lay on top. They won't actually get into where they need. So we're seeing a, a lot of that. This, especially this back one, this first one, isn't quite getting threaded if we're not um, being taut enough. I'm gonna come down. I'm gonna swing around and come back up. I'm going to travel to the right side of my take up lever and then come back forward so that it pops into place right here. Then we're going to come down. There is a guide at this point on the machine. Let's move you over here. And then there is one to the back left. Once we have threaded this portion of the machine, depending upon the model that you have, you're going to put your presser foot down. Now, the model that I'm on, the moment I, um, I'm gonna lower my presser foot by hand, my um, 480 and up, your, when you bring your needle threader down, your foot is going to go down, okay? So it, there's an automation there that happens. So I'm gonna kind of walk you through, I'm gonna zoom you in over here. I'm gonna walk you through using the needle threader and I'm gonna try to do it without keeping my hand out of the way. Now, I'm gonna bring my needle threader down about halfway. I'm going to wrap from the back to the front around this little um, post that's there. So I'm coming under and around it. After I get that, I'm going to bring this all the way down so that this portion swings to the needle. I'm then going to bring my thread over and I'm going to, there's a slit here that you can see typically if you look from the side. Um, I'm gonna bring my thread to the slit and on my four and five series machines, there is a, a thread cutter right up here at the top that you will then cut your thread and then as you let your left hand go, you're going to um, pull a loop to the back of the needle and then your needle will be threaded. Now, for my seven series machines, you don't have this little um, cutter. So what's gonna happen is as you let go of your right hand, as you let go of your left hand slowly, you're going to drop how tight you're holding the tail in your right hand. And then the system will pull a loop and then you can grab a hold of the loop. If you hold your right hand too tight, the machine cannot pull a loop and it won't thread. <clears throat> the other thing to remember is that you cannot thread a needle smaller than a 75 on the, um, with the needle threader, okay? So if you're trying to thread that size 65 needle, it's not gonna happen. The reason being is the eye of a 75 and down, well the eye of a 70 needle and smaller, is too small for the needle threader hook that's built into the needle threader and two strands of thread to come through the eye at one time. Okay, so that's why um, it's nothing smaller than a 75. So this does take some practice uh, coordination. Once you get it, you won't have any problems with it. But it is, it's key that one, that your presser foot goes down, two, that your needle is in the highest position, and that if you take a couple of times, make sure you pull to a new place in the thread so that you don't um, aren't trying to 
uh, work with a, a piece of thread that you've raveled or anything along that line. So, <clears throat> okay. Now, let's go back to my eight series machines and let me cover them quickly. Now, winding a bobbin on an eight series machine is done from the front of the machine. Okay, you're gonna get to see my dirty little room here. Okay, okay. now, <clears throat> when we wind bobbins on an eight series machine, you will notice that you have three spool pins on an eight series machine. You've got two to the left of this dark plastic guard and one to the right of that. The spool pin that's to the right of that guard is dedicated for bobbin winding, okay? We also have at the very top, let's see if we can lift up here, you have three, um, Spool uh, thread guides. There we go. So you have two individuals, and then you have one that has a um, is a double. This double guide is for your uh, bobbin winding. Okay. So I'm going to place my spool. I'm going to come up to the double guide that's up at the top. I'm gonna travel to the guide that's right on the um, thread stand. I'm going to then travel over to this silver dot. There is an arrow on this dot that tells you the direction in which to travel. So I'm actually gonna travel counterclockwise and I wanna make sure that I kinda of give this a pull so that again, it pops into the in between those two pieces of metal. My bobbin, I'm going to take and put onto the machine with the silver side out, okay? I'm going to then travel up to the top and I'm going to follow the arrow and wrap a few times and cut my thread. Now, my screen is going to look a little bit different because I have a slightly older machine sitting here um, in my studio. You will get the option to um, for figuring out what speed you want, not speed, how um, much bobbin you want it to wind. So you can have it automatically wind you 25% of a bobbin and stop. You are ultimately in control. You can start winding and stop winding whenever you want, okay? So you just press the start and stop button. You can control the speed at which you wind and things along that lines, okay? Once the bobbin is wound, the machine will stop. We can remove our bobbin and cut our thread. Okay. Now let's look at putting a bobbin in. Come over here. Now, an eight series machine, the bobbin case is built into the machine. And this whole unit right here is the bobbin case. I'm gonna take my bobbin, okay, silver out and place it into the bobbin case. I'm gonna bring my thread tail up and around to the slit in the side of my bobbin case. Let me um, change this screen, okay. I'm gonna bring the slit to the side of my bobbin case I'm gonna bring my thread down and I'm going to pull straight out to the left. And what I'm looking for is for the thread to um, get into the, um, there is a, underneath there is a um, tension band that looks like a forked tongue. It's kind of a U, it's got a U-shaped opening between it. So we want the thread to travel between that U-shaped opening. Let me um, get a mirror. 
my eight series owners, you have were given a mirror with your machine that you can use to check to make sure that it is in the proper location. Okay. Do not be afraid to pull six to eight inches in order to get your um, tension threaded. Okay. It's important that you pull a few inches so that you can get it into place. It will solve a lot of frustration if you get it, if you pull a tail. Do not try to do this with a tiny tail. Let me show you a graphic. Here is what you're looking for on the underside of the case. That U-shaped arrow right there, and you want the thread to be coming out from it. So as you're pulling it, you're pulling it into that. This is your tension underneath of that. So you wanna make sure that your thread gets pulled into that tension area. Once your bobbin is threaded, you're just gonna close the door and have it pop, okay? Now, let me get this situated for threading the upper portion of the machine. We're gonna thread the top half of an eight series machine. Okay. Now, an eight series is a fully automated threading system, okay? And we have, you know, the good and the bad with everything. So it may take a little bit, but for the most part, I've got a couple of tricks that I think will help um, you with threading. Try to get this situated in a way that you can see. Never in my life would I have thought it. I'd need, own, running a quilt store, I would need a video studio. All right, so let's talk about, so since I don't have a good old video studio, you get to see the good, the bad, and the ugly of a functional sewing room. <laughs> Now, when I go to thread the machine, I'm going to move, if you're not using a secondary spool of thread, I'm gonna move to one of the other ones. I'm gonna thread one of the single thread guides. I'm gonna hold the thread in my um, right hand and the tail in my left. I'm going to come upwards and I'm going to stay here until this needle threading light illuminates, okay? So by coming up into this area, what we've done, oops, what we have done is kicked the, um, we've hit the threading sensor. So once that threading sensor has been hit, we stand here and pause again until that light illuminates. If we just hit this sensor and keep on going, we don't, the thread doesn't always get into the proper tension discs or in the proper location to thread the machine properly. So we want to pause, let the machine get itself set up, and then we will follow the rest of the path. And then we're gonna come to the lips and we're going to then cut, and then we're gonna press the button for threading, okay? Now, if for some reason, like it didn't thread there, if it doesn't thread, all you're gonna do is press that button on the head of the machine and then set it up again for threading and then push it again. Okay. Just like that. Now, one thing to note is if you are going to be threading a double needle, your 880 is not going to thread, the automatic threading system is not going to allow the threading of a double needle. So what will happen is when you hit that first take up with, that kicks the sensor, before you continue to thread, you're going to on screen touch this icon that has a um, hand at a needle. You will then go through, thread your machine like normal, and then you're going to press the highlighted threading button. We still need the upper 
insides of the machine to thread, but we just don't want the actual needle threader to swing to the needles. So we still need to press this when we are doing manual needle threading on an 880. Again, this threader should not thread anything smaller than a 75. If you go to a smaller needle, you just need to set the machine up for manual threading. Okay? All right. Let's talk about presser feet. Okay? Because we have a variety of presser feet available in the world of Bernina, and they are going to be um, numbered. And the numbers will correspond just kind of back to a chart that lets you know what that, because it's what that foot is, because you obviously can't write what the foot is on the actual foot. You will find that you have presser feet that have um, just numbers that you will have presser feet that have numbers and the letter C, and then you have presser feet that will have numbers and the letter D. Our presser feet are all one piece metal. They require no, um, no extra tools can be easily changed with one hand. Uh, nothing needs to be, um, screwed in or clipped on and things like that. Now, some Berninas do come with snap-on soles, okay? I think the 435 may have snap-on soles. Uh, they did some changing, some of them did, and then they changed them and then so on and so forth. So if you have snap-on soles, any foot you purchase after the initial set that comes with the machine will be that all one piece metal foot, okay? And can easily be changed with one hand, okay? Basically, it's just the lift of a lever on the side. You have what looks like a little ice cream cone peg kind of coming down from the machine. We have a hole in the bottom of the foot. We're going to put the ice cream cone in the holder and then pull that lever down until it, it, it won't move anymore. There's no click, there's no lock, okay, until it won't move anymore. Now, <clears throat> I had mentioned that you've got feet that are C's and D's and just numbers. If a presser foot is just a number, that means that that foot is only capable of stitching up to a five and a half millimeter wide stitch, okay, meaning wide, meaning left to right. If the presser foot has a C after it, that means that it is tells the machine that it is capable of, of stitching nine millimeters wide, provided that your model machine can stitch nine millimeters wide, okay? And then the letter D designates our feet that we use for dual feed. Um, the D feet, when you put them on the machine, you need to um, engage your dual feed. Okay, if you don't engage the dual feed and, and use that foot, it's not going to cause any harm, but you will find that things just may not feed correctly. You may see some puckering or some gathering. Um, so we just need to engage the dual feed. Engaging dual feed is just reaching up in the back where you would have normally um, reached to lower your presser foot and you just pull the dual feed down and it snaps into place, okay? It's not, again, no, no tools or things required. We have over 80 uh, presser feet and accessories for your machines. The big book of feet is a nice uh, colored spiral bound encyclopedia. Every foot is covered, why it's made the way it is, what it was designed to do, and all of the additional things that that foot can do besides what it was designated to. For example, a number 10 foot is an edge stitch foot. The edge stitch foot is traditionally used for stitching on the edge. However, there's like 12 additional things that we can use foot number 10 for, okay? It will also tell you if the foot comes uh, coded for nine millimeter or D for dual feet. 
Uh, the Bernina machines have slide-on tray tables. Some of the slide-on tray tables have a release button on them. I believe uh, the 480 and up have the release button. Um, so you would press the button and slide the tray table to the um, left to remove it. And then to put it in on, you would just slide the tray table on and snap it in place. My machines that don't have um, the release buttons, they still slide on and slide off without without an issue. You just it you just have to get it released from the um, first little piece here, and usually you just kind of slide it. I forgot my tray table for this particular model today. <clears throat> All right. If you have any questions about machine setup please feel free to comment or send us an email and we will be happy to help you. Let's talk about personalizing the machine, setting up stitches and things along that lines. Hover and needle up, needle down. On your machines, you can customize the background color. You'll see in the upper corner that the machine that I have on screen has a magenta background. The screens I were using earlier was a gray background. I have one that has a blue background and they're easy to adjust. Excuse me. So to adjust your screen color, we come into the personal setup. Now my five series, my four and five series machines to find this gear icon, you would touch the home button and then you will find this gear icon. We touch gears, and then we touch the little picture of the little person, okay? When you come in to this, everything here is the colors of your background. Everything on the right-hand side that you see, some may be more or less options, um, are relate to background patterns, okay, that can fall in the background. On your screen, this may say welcome. If you touch that, you can change this um, welcome to read anything that you would like. And basically what happens is when you uh, boot your machine up or turn your machine on and it comes to the white screen where it says Bernina made to create, whatever you have typed here would display on that screen. Um, for your um, viewing pleasure, okay? When you're all done selecting your screen, you can hit the X in the upper right-hand corner to close that um, function. Now, let's look at how we select stitches on the machine. We have a couple of options. One, you can just come over and touch anything you want. Depending upon the machine and the screen, some of the machines have page arrows that will page you through more stitches in that particular folder. Excuse me. Or you may have to touch and drag depending on my, my four or five and um, some of my seven series would touch and drag. These tabs down the right hand side are going to open you into additional menus of stitches. So you have your practical stitches, your decoratives, which are further broken down into folders and categorized, your sewing alphabets, your buttonholes, your decorative quilting stitches, and then you have a heart, which is where you would save your additional uh, favorite stitches at. Okay. Now, you will see that most of you can only see either nine to 12 stitches at a time. If you're not a fan of paging or scrolling, this icon here is going to allow you to transition. So if you touch this arrow that's here on the side, it will swipe out and show you a larger selection of stitches at a time and then you can choose the one that you want. If you expanded it and you wanna minimize it, just touch the arrow again. 
The other way that you can um, find stitches is through the search function. You'll notice in the upper right hand corner, you have either a magnifying glass or magnifying glass with the number zero through nine in it. This is the search function. So if you're ever in a class or you're reading your paperwork from the workbook and it tells you to go to stitch 1342 and you have no idea where to find 1342, you open up your zero through nine type in the stitch number and then hit the green check mark. Now, if it doesn't go anywhere, it means that the number doesn't exist. Okay, and let's see if I can find, I think we have 714. Okay, so when the stitch shows up in the preview window, it lets you know that you found a stitch and then to close the search function, you just hit the magnifying glass again and it will show you exactly where you live. Okay. Now let's talk about presser feet. Okay. You will notice over on the left hand side of your screen, you have a picture of what looks like the sole of a presser foot. This here, so right this second, the 570, 590, 790, and 880 have what we call presser foot recognition. The, these machines want to know exactly what foot you have put on the machine. You'll notice that on your screen you have the um, picture of a sole of the foot. And the machine won't sew until this setting matches the setting of the, what foot is actually on the machine. On all the other machines, this function is a presser foot recommendation. Meaning that if you don't know what foot to use, this would be uh, the place to go. The machine is always going to show you the recommended foot. Sorry. The machine is always going to show you the recommended foot. If you don't own that particular foot, then you can choose another foot. So for example, if I go to stitch number nine on the machine, on other machines, this would immediately pop up to, to showing you a foot number five, okay? And then on foot number five is our blind hem foot. On the 570, 590, 790, and 880, I've told the machine I have foot one C on, but if I come in here, See how foot number five has a gold star? The gold star feet are the feet that are going to work the best and are truly the recommended feet. This function here at the top will allow you to see only the gold starred feet. Okay, and then you can choose the foot that you're going to use and then close the screen. And then for my, the 570, 590, 790, and 880, the picture of the presser foot will change so that you can kind of see what it looks like. I'm gonna go back to foot 1C. I'm gonna go back to a straight stitch, okay? So that's a little bit about presser foot recognition. More information can be found on page 10 of the workbook. So on my slides at the very bottom, it'll tell you what page on the workbook that it specifically talks about it. I jump around in the workbook. I feel um, I have set the mastery classes up for a slightly different flow. I think they um, work better in the particular order that I have set it up as. So that's why we jump around. Okay, and then I chose that. Now, for machines that have um, automatic presser foot lowering, you have a variety of ways to lower your presser foot, okay? The moment you tap on the foot control, your foot will go down on the machine. You can also press the um, machine presser foot raise and lower, okay? Um, press it once the foot goes down, press it again, the foot goes up. 
And then you can also um, lower the foot using the start stop unit on the machine. Okay, the start stop button. And the foot will go down. Depending upon how you have your machine set up will depend upon if um, the foot goes all the way down or if the foot goes down to uh, kind of a hover. So you have a couple of options. I typically just tap my foot control and my foot will lower. That allows me to be able to keep both hands on my fabric and not have to um, try to balance my exact positioning with one hand while I'm using the other hand to push buttons. So I'm gonna start, we're gonna start working through some exercises. I am not going to have, I'm not gonna physically sew each one of these exercises, but I recommend that you um, print your workbook and sit down with the workbook and work through them step by step. The instructions are all there and practice these exercises. Um, I It will help you be more familiar with your machine and um, get more comfortable with pushing buttons. The first thing that I want to talk about is how to set the machine up for stopping with the needle in the down position. Okay? So this is the location on how you can have the machine stop with the needle in the down position. Right now, with the way that the screen is set up here, the needle is above the line. When the needle is above the line, that means when you stop sewing, the needle is going to stop in the up position. Okay, so I'm gonna sew here. I stop, and my needle is going to stop in the up position if you have it set that way. Give me one second. So my needle stops up. To change this, you would just press this button. Your needle will go below the line and then the needle will now stop in the down position. And so if we sew and then we stop, the needle will stop in the down position. Okay, now, how would you then get your needle into the up position? Okay, so getting your needle to raise out of fabric can be done in a, in a couple of ways. One, you have the back of your foot control. If you have one of the, um, if your foot control looks like this, the foot the heel of the foot control is what we call a heel kick. And so what you would do is actually put your whole foot on the gas pedal, the way that it was designed to be used, and you press back with your heel. And when you press back with your heel, your needle will come up if it's down, or it will go down if it comes up. Okay? And then let's get this moving here for you so we can up and down so it allows you to take half a stitch at a time the other way to raise and lower your needle is you actually have a button on your machine to the right of your sorry to the left of your screen above the slide speed control and it actually has the picture of a needle and an up and a down arrow on it and using that button is going to, pressing that button will raise and lower your needle a step at a time. So if you're not coordinated enough to use your foot control to raise and lower your needle, or you've set your foot control to do something else, which we'll talk about in a minute, you can use the buttons on the machine, okay? Now, when you use the needle in the down position option, you have the ability to also then insert your freehand system. Oh, let's skip that. We'll come back to that in a minute. Have the ability to insert your freehand system. Your freehand system is this metal bar that you see here that comes um, as an optional accessory for my 435, but everybody else, you get your metal bar. That, that freehand system 
is basically just like it has been on Bernina for many, many years. You allows you to raise and lower the presser foot without having to remove your hands from your work. So you insert the freehand system just like you see in the image. You would press with your right knee. While your knee is pressing on the bar, the foot goes up. You can do your positioning and then release your knee and the foot will then go back down, okay? So that is one option to be able to um, raise and lower the foot without needing to use the lifter in the back of the machine or buttons on the machine to raise and lower the foot. I use the freehand system a lot um, to save time. I use it when I'm applicating by machine as well. Now, on some machines, the ones that are listed, the 570 and up, we have a function called hover, okay? So hover is um, a setting that we can do on the machine so that when we stop with the needle in the down position, the foot will raise a little bit or a lot. Okay, so to get to your settings for hover, we come back into um, using the personal setup. We're going to go into sewing settings, programmable buttons, and then we're going to customize needle stop down. Now, these are your three options to hover. The one that's currently selected on this machine is no hover. It means when I stop with the needle in the down position, don't raise the foot. The second option would raise the foot slightly and the third option would raise the foot a lot. Okay? So you have those particular options to adjust your hover. And then when you get your setting, you can hit the X and then it will take effect. Now, I there are times I use hover and times I don't use hover. So I this is something that I turn on and off depending upon what I'm doing. Like I don't use hover when I'm strip piecing. When I stop sewing, I don't need my foot to raise, but I will use hover if I'm appliquing um, putting binding on a quilt, things along that lines. So it's something that you will get familiar with to be able to, to turn on and off. Now, I had talked earlier about your programmable foot control. Now, for those that have that same foot control with that heel kick, you if you're not a huge person of using the needle up, needle down, you'd rather use the buttons, and you want the heel kick on the foot control to do something else, you can program that. Again, that's found in personal setup, sewing settings, foot control. Now, when I come in here right now, I can see that the foot control is set to do a heel kick of a needle up, needle down. If I want that to change, I'm going to set it up to my, my personal favorites. And depending upon how your machine was last set will depend upon what it does. I can have the machine tie a knot when I do a heel kick. You have two options of knots. You have a knot in place or you have a small series of tiny running stitches in a row. For those running stitches, you can do anywhere from two up to six stitches in a row. You can have the system cut your thread when you kick back. You can have the system raise the foot when you kick on the heel. Or you can have the system do all three. So if all three of these options are selected, when I step back on my heel, it's going to tie a knot in place, cut my thread, and then raise my foot, okay? so. I personally, this has not changed. I have been uh, sewing on Bernina's for almost 18 years. And in those 18 years, heel kick is needle up, needle down. I'm unable to teach this dog a new trick. And if I change this from needle up, needle down, it requires too much thought for me to remember 
that it's not what it does anymore. So for me, my foot control stays at a heel kick, but you do have the ability to adjust it to whatever you like. So now let's take a look at how we secure stitches, the tie on and tie off option on the machine, and how to personalize what the scissors do when you push those buttons. You're gonna find that the machines today are highly customizable and you can have the machine do what you want it to do when you push certain buttons. So the first up is let's learn how to secure stitches. So the first way to secure a stitch is going to be with the good old fashioned reverse, okay? So our quick reverse button on the machines are going to be, um, one second, are going to be your good old reverse button right there at the top of the screen. Okay. And when we start to sew, if you press and hold the reverse button, the machine will sew backwards as long as you're holding the button. When you let go of the button, the machine will travel forwards again. Okay. You do not need to stop the machine in order to activate the reverse function. You can just push the button in the middle of the stitch. Okay. That is your standard reverse. Works on every stitch on the machine. As long as you are holding the button, the machine will sew backwards. Okay. Now, let's look at and that will give you your good old fashioned backstitch. Let's look at stitch number five on the machines. Stitch number five on the machine is going to be a, um, what we call a securing program, okay? So when we look at stitch number five, it's got this funny little thing at the beginning and then it looks like a straight stitch and then this funny little thing at the end and it looks normal on your screen, what this is, is this actually has a um, built-in backstitch already um, in the system. So what's gonna happen is when we start sewing in a minute, it's gonna sew forwards, the machine will automatically sew backwards without needing to press any buttons, and then it will come back forwards again. When I am ready to do the reverse at the end, all I need to do is press this button once and then let go, okay? So let's watch what it does. Automatically back stitches. When I'm ready for it to reverse again at the end, I'm just going to touch the button once and then I'm gonna keep my foot on the gas until the machine stops. And then I can cut my thread and raise my foot, okay? And then you will have your standard reverse, okay? Looks just like it did with this function. I use this stitch a lot when I am um, using a, um, when I'm garment sewing, okay? For me, when I'm garment sewing, I don't always have a um, back stitch because when I'm quilting, I don't really back stitch. When I change to garment sewing, I need, it's hard, sometimes it takes a little bit to get me in the habit of back stitching at the beginning and ending of a stitch. So if I switch to this stitch when I'm garment sewing, the automatic backstitch happens at the beginning and that triggers me to remember to backstitch at the end. So it, it works both ways for us, okay? Now, the other stitch is going to be stitch number either 1324 for my seven and eight series machines or 1301 for my four and fives. Now you could go to the search function and type those numbers in. I just happen to know that any stitch that starts with a 1-3 is going to be in the quilt menu, okay? And 1324 or 1301 will be the first stitch option there, okay? You will see that in this stitch, there are some very tiny stitches at the beginning, 
regular stitch and very tiny stitches at the end. This stitch does the same thing that that securing stitch does at that we just did with the exception of this is going to take some very tiny stitches at the beginning and then pick up with regular stitch length and then it will take some very tiny running stitches at the end. Okay. And let me, it's hard to see because um, my thread matches so well, but little tiny stitches right there at the end that knot this in place and it's not going to go anywhere. Okay. My, my threads are kind of knotted. This stitch, this quilter securing stitch is what I use when I am um, quilting a quilt, okay? Because when I'm quilting a quilt, I want to make sure that I don't have any of this bulky overstitching, okay? So I make sure that this is the choice that I use, and then that keeps me from having to bury all my tails and manually tie all my knots, okay? Remember, just as we had in uh, for machine embroidery that we talked about a while ago, we also have breadcrumbs that trail across the top of the screen when we get into folders so that you know kind of where you went and where you came from for navigation purposes because this will be handy just so that when we're navigating um, screens you can know where to go okay so for example this beginning tie on and tie off you're going to find that if you choose your personal setup and then choose sewing settings. And we're going to talk about this function right here. Okay. Beginning tie on or tie off is basically if this has got a green line next to it, it means that the system is going to automatically tie you a knot in place at the beginning of your stitch, okay? So this is going to tie you a knot at the beginning of your stitch. If you don't want that to happen, you need to turn this off. And turning it off is just a matter of touching it so that it becomes a red circle. Now on my machines, this function lives off because I want to tie a knot in the way that I want to tie a knot. And so I don't want this stitch in place to build me up a, a bulky knot if I'm quilting a quilt. I would much rather use stitch 1324 or 1301 to tie the knot that I want versus this style of knot that happens here at the beginning tie off. The other thing with this beginning tie off is if you do not start either so that your first stitch is in fabric and you start several stitches off of the edge of fabric before it starts sewing, this tie off can cause some bird's nesting, uh, ugly stitching at the beginning of a stitch. So if you are not going to turn it off, I would suggest that you make sure that your fabric is right at the beginning of the um, foot so that the first stitch is going to happen in fabric, okay? It's not going to be pretty if it isn't, okay? So you want to make sure, or you can use a leader and an ender to start, but this is how you turn this function on and off. Okay, again, personal preference. While we're in here, let's take a look at scissor cutting. So we're gonna come to programmable buttons and we're going to look at scissors. Just like we could with the foot control, we can, can, we can adjust what the system does when we push the scissor button. 
okay? So when we hit the scissors, right now the way that this is set up, when I press scissors, the machine is just going to cut my thread. I can activate the knot function so that the machine will stitch a knot in place and then cut my thread. If you're not a fan of the in-place knot and you'd much rather have those running stitches, then you would choose this running stitch option and then adjust the number of stitches you want for your knot. Again, anywhere from two to six stitches in place, okay? So you can set this up to be any setting that you want for your particular scissors. Now, again, it's gonna depend upon the stitch that you're using. If I'm using that securing stitch that we used there at 1301 or 1324, I don't need the machine to tie me another knot after I've already tied the knot with the stitch. So I would have my scissors just set up as to cut thread, okay? So lots of ways to change your thread cutter. Your machines have a setting in here. So let me come back. I'm gonna walk back one button here and you'll see this option um, under the reverse function. Um, that is gives you the choice of a reverse or a back step. Now, if you've ever um, tried to reverse on a decorative stitch, it never truly goes backwards in the same holes it came forwards in, okay? So it, it doesn't always make it pretty. Back stepping, okay? Um, is literally the machine walks backwards in the same needle penetrations that it came forwards in, okay? So you have the option to always have your machine set to back step or to have it just set up as quick reverse. Now for me, the machine is set at home for on my machines, it's always set at quick reverse. We have another location in the decorative stitch area that I'll show you in a little bit where you can activate back stepping per stitch. It does not have to be the default built into the machine. Um, and then you can activate it when you want to activate it. So I will show that to you um, in a little bit. So let's look at how we edit stitches, we save stitches and how we can pull up the history stitches um, on machines for um, pulling up stitches that we've been sewing and things like that. So I'm gonna close out of this here. You will notice on your screen that you have a letter I. And the letter I is going to open up the edit menu or the informational menu. And so when I choose the I, basically what's gonna happen is this screen is gonna swipe out and these are all settings or options or features that we can use with this particular stitch. Some of them are grayed out because they just don't apply to the screens that we're currently in. These refer to buttonholes, these refer to combi mode, this is for alphabets, and the other one is for another decorative set of um, functions. So you may not have everything for every stitch, this option right here, this is going to activate continuous reverse, which means that when we select it, the machine is gonna sew backwards without us having to hold any reverse buttons. This is where you would activate back stepping for that particular stitch, okay? So this is how you can just turn it on by a stitch by stitch basis. These two functions, of save and reset, I will talk about in a little bit. But this gives you the options for all um, that you can do to the machine, to a, to a stitch. So the first thing that we're gonna look at is we're gonna look at the pattern repeat function. And so pattern repeat 
is going to allow us to tell the system how many of this particular pattern do you I want you to stitch. So on my 590 and my 570, when you touch pattern repeat, you'll actually get a keyboard and you can go anywhere from one to 99. Excuse me. And for my pat, uh, for the rest of our machines, you have the ability for a um, pattern repeat of up to a pattern repeat of nine. So you can set the system up for one through nine. So if I touch the pattern repeat function once, I'm going to get one repeat. You can do this with any stitch on the machine, okay? If I touch it again, I'm gonna get two repeats, three repeats, and I can keep touching it until it cycles back to being off. Off means, it has the X there, it means it's gonna keep stitching that same pattern over and over and over again until you tell it to stop, okay? I'm gonna leave it set for the moment at four repeats just so that we have it set up um, for another little um, exercise. So now that we have four repeats setting here, I have the ability to step on the gas and the machine is going to sew just these four repeats, okay? So let me pull that up here on a different machine. What I'm going to do is I'm going to step on the gas and I'm going to leave my foot on the gas until the machine stops. When the machine stops, let's, let's put some thread in it and we'll be good to go. When the machine stops, the um, stitching is done. Do not try to anticipate when the machine is finished, okay? It will be finished when it stops, okay? So don't try to anticipate it. So just keep your foot on the gas. The machine will stop all by itself when it is done stitching all four repeats. Well, I am not having a good night here. I cleared out my repeats, so it kept on going. So, four repeats. So. Just finished sewing the fourth repeat. And I can take it out. Okay, so there was the rest of the one that I finished up here. And then two, three, four. Okay, so there's your repeats. Okay. Now, now that we have repeats set up, we can also actually also mirror image. So what you're seeing on the slide is the four repeats stitched regular. And then we've used the mirror image up down function. Mirror image up down is the ones where we the two triangles are on top of each other. And if I flip that, the stitches will flip the other direction. And now when I sewed them, they'll be pointing the other way. And so you could work through stitching for regular, flipping, stitch for mirror imaged unmirror image, mirror image, and then create your own little stitch recipe of a stitch that doesn't exist on the machine per se, okay? So you have, you know, some fun that you can do there. So to activate it, you just touch it. To deactivate it, you touch it again, and it will turn itself off, okay? The clear button on the machine will clear out any changes you've made to any setting on the stitch. So if I press clear, my repeats are gone, my mirror image is gone, and I am back to sewing what we call single stitch mode, okay? So that is 
a quick, easy way to get a stitch back to the way that it was. We also have a mirror image left, right. Now, mirror image left, right is only gonna work for stitches that are not symmetrical left from right. So for example, the blanket stitch that you see in the screen or the scallop that you see on the other machine screen. And then if I come into eye, I can mirror image. This is mirror image left, right. And then the scallops will go the other direction. Okay, so again, click it to activate it, touch it again to deactivate it. Okay. Now, altering stitches on the machine, you have the ability to adjust your width, length, needle position, and all of that on a stitch. You have two knobs to the right of your screen, which are the top knob is going to control your stitch width. And you'll notice that as you make adjustments to width, there is a change in the upper number. This number is your stitch width value. You can adjust the stitch width with both the knob or you can touch that number. You can use the plus or minus, or you can touch and drag the bar up on the screen. Okay. Now, you can also adjust stitch length in the same manner. So stitch length is going to, um, let me slide this over a little bit. Stitch length is going to, again, adjust, increase, decrease. The number on the left-hand side of your screen is your stitch length value. And if you touch that value, then you have the ability to adjust. You can slide the bar to adjust that. The quickest way to return a stitch value back to the default is to just touch the yellow box. So if I wanted to take this back to the default stitch length setting, and I have no idea what that is, and you just want to go back, yes, yes, you could press clear, but remember, clear is going to get rid of your width, length, needle position, mirror image. If you only want to reset one value, open it up and touch the yellow square. Touching the yellow highlighted option will deactivate it or return it to default, okay? Your needle position is found, it is two, two buttons right below your stitch length thumb, and you press the right button to move the needle to the right, and you press the left button to move your needle to the left. And when you do so, you will get a, an icon that shows you the value of where you've moved it. So right now my needle is in the far right number five position. If I wanted to move that value back to center, all I would need to do is touch the icon or the value on screen and it will clear it back out to put you back in center needle position. I do wanna take a moment to point out something with stitch length when it comes to decorative stitches. So I'm gonna come open a decorative stitch and you'll notice that when I chose a decorative stitch, this stitch length number is giant. And you're probably thinking, oh my goodness, that's like basting stitch length. However, basting stitch length, yes, is a big number. It's usually six millimeters or so on the machine. When it comes to decorative stitches, this number that you're viewing here is actually the length of one repeat of this pattern. So if I came in and I came to a repeat of one, I'm at 14.6 and so on. And then you would know that every time you add another repeat, you would add another 14.6 millimeters. There is no way to turn this into inches, okay? Now, you may be thinking, well, okay, so I have 28 millimeters to fill and I, 
at 14.6, this is a little bit too much that I'm gonna overshoot my, my area. If I touch this function, this is telling me that at a 2.4 millimeter stitch length, one repeat is 14.6. So I could decrease this until I got this to a setting that was easily divisible to fit my space that I'm allowed. So I could bring this down to a 2.3. That's gonna put me about two tenths of a millimeter bigger than what I need, which is very, very small. And I could probably make that work. So I just point this out so that when you get into stitches, this number doesn't give you a panic attack at the beginning. Okay, so just remember they're telling you that this is the length of one repeat. Okay, now <clears throat> know that when you are playing with decorative stitches or not even decorative stitches, even just standard stitches, and you're adjusting lengths and widths and defaults, you have something, a, a function on your machine called temporary altered memory, meaning that when you make adjustments to a stitch, so let's say I came and I did take this up to a basting stitch length, okay? And I, let me, um, sewed it, okay? Then I came to a zigzag and I made adjustments to a zigzag and I sewed it. Okay, when I come back to a straight stitch, it is still set to the way it was the last time I was there. Okay, so it comes in handy and allows you to jump around all of your stitches in a particular project and they be set up the way you used them the last time you were there. So all of your settings have been retained while you are working on a project. These settings will stay until you turn the machine off or until you clear them out of the system by using the clear function or by coming into here and returning things to default, okay? So it's a good habit to get into when you are working with a bunch of stitches, specifically basting, because I speak from experience, that you just happen to glance up at a stitch when you go back to using it after you've navigated away from it to make sure it is the settings that you choose to use, okay? And I've basted a lot of things together that were not meant to be basted together. Now, if you wanted to overwrite the default setting on the machine. So for example, they use stitch number four, I'm gonna use stitch number one. If the 2.5 stitch length is too long for you, I have a lot, let's say uh, you are a huge paper piecing person or foundation piecing and 2.5 is too big and you always come to your machine and as soon as you turn it on and you decrease your stitch length to let's say two. You have the ability on this on your machines to open up the information menu and choose this little floppy disk image. So what this means, it means that you have taken and saved your settings over default. So when you turn the machine off and you turn it back on, when you come back, when it reboots back up, this has now become the default setting for this stitch, okay? So for example, for me, um, on my machines at home, when I blanket stitch, I always blanket stitch with my needle in the right position, okay, my far right. And I typically use a um, wider stitch width and a slightly longer stitch length. Just depends upon the project. But I have this 
set as my default setting so that anytime I open up my uh, blanket stitch, my needle's already going to be moved and I won't need to remember to move it and it's set up the way that I want. So that's how you would overwrite the default. And again, this setting changes will stay until you turn it off. Not the machine off, but until you turn the setting off. And so to, re to remove that setting or to set it back to default, all you do is open up the stitch and choose don't save. When everything, when you've selected don't save, now everything will return back to the default settings. You see, I went back to default length, default width, and my needle's back in center, okay? My 790 and my 880s, you have what we call history stitches. Your history stitches are that last folder that you um, see on your um, stitch tab. This last folder <clears throat> is going to contain the last 24 stitches that you have sewn on the machine. Now, I haven't sewn any on this machine, which is why they're not showing up there. But the last 24 stitches will show in your screen. These stitches will also retain all of the uh, settings that you used for them, even if you've turned the machine off. Okay, if you've turned the machine off, it's been a few days, you come back, you open up the machine, you come into your history stitches and pick up any of the stitches here. They will reopen in the same settings that you had originally stitched them in a few days ago. It holds 24 stitches. When you stitch the 25th stitch, the, 20, the first one drops off and everything moves down in line. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> If there is a particular stitch that you wanted to save long term, okay, you would open up the stitch, you will set it up the way that you like it, and then you would touch the, um, pers the personal program, okay? So again, if I didn't want to overwrite the default of my stitch, but I did want to save my settings, I'm going to set my stitch up. I'm going to come to the heart. I'm going to tell the system to put the stitch into a folder. I'm going to choose one of four folders. You cannot name these folders. They just have numbers attached to them. So I would take and I would think about um, setting up, you know, even if it's a little post-it note or something to say that folder one are these stitches and folder two, the stitches that apply to this project or things along that lines. Um, once I've chosen, uh, I've opened, I'm gonna pick the folder I'm gonna save it into. And then I'm going to press the green check mark. Okay, now it's saved. I can come out, I can choose other stitches, do what I need to do. When I want to reopen this stitch, okay, so this is saving. And then when I want to reopen the stitch, I'm going to choose the personal folder. I'm going to open a stitch, choose the folder, and you will see a preview of the stitch with the settings that are set for width and length. So you could save 15 different options of a buttonhole or 15 different blanket stitches. Um, and then you'd be able to know which one was which because you will get um, the width and length set showing in the preview. And then all you do is select it and there's my stitch. And now I'm ready to sew it, okay? Now, let's look at um, cleaning security programs and cleaning and maintenancing. Okay, so the security program on the machine is here to help you protect you 
more along the lines from um, clicking, uh, stitching something that can't be stitched because of the needle that you have in, because of the stitch plate you have on, anything along that lines. Now on the uh, seven, seven and eight series machines, this is your needle security program. This is your stitch plate security program. On my four and five series machines, your needle and stitch plate program, uh, security program are just one option. And honestly, for my seven and eight series machines, yes, you have two places you can touch, but they both open the same window, okay? So when you open that window across the top, you get your choice of some specialty needles. So if you were gonna use a double needle, and they're done by size, excuse me, done by size, you have triple needles, wing needles, double wing needles, and punch needles. So when we tell the machine that we've put one of those needles in, it will not allow you to do a stitch that is too wide for the capability of those needles. When you're all done stitching with that needle, you would come back in and choose the first gold starred option, which would be a standard needle. The same applies to stitch plates. Um, when you set your machine up by using a different stitch plate, you will again see the option showing to you in a yellow on the screen. So if you have set yourself for a straight stitch plate and have gone to try to stitch a zigzag, so if I go to a zigzag, the machine is only sewing a straight stitch. I can pick Stitch decorative stitches till my heart's content, but it's only going to sew a straight stitch because we've told the machine to only sew a straight stitch and to only keep our needle in center. The moment I come back in and go back to my standard stitch plate, my decorative stitches and zigzags would appear, okay? <clears throat> the other thing I wanna point out here is this little guy right here. This is your needle minder. Your needle minder would come up with a series of different types of needles and all of the sizes. So when you select a needle and then you put the size, this is what you're, you're telling the machine this is the needle that you have in. And the only purpose for doing this is so that you don't forget what needle you have in and you don't have to go find a magnifying glass to read the little tiny etchings in the end of the needle. So this, this is not gonna change if you put a different needle in, okay? They're not, those needles are not microchipped or anything. So we physically have to come in here and tell it that we've put in a different needle. What's gonna happen is when your machine boots up and it comes to that screen that says Bernina made to create, in the bottom, you'll get a little dialog box that tells you that this is the needle that you have in the machine. But again, you have to have good practice and good um, um, actions to remember to come in and change this when you change those needles, okay? needle and security. The creative consultant on your machines is the dress form. The dress form um, is can be found for my four and five series machines by pressing the home button first and then the dress form will show up at the bottom of your screen. Your creative consultant is here to help you um, so different types of fabric with different techniques using the correct thread, needle, foot, and stitch. So when you um, choose your fabric type, if you are have no idea what these fabric types are trying to depict, if you press the question mark, you will get a blue ring around your screen and then you can touch the icon and it's gonna tell you what that icon is. 
This works in any screen, okay? So we're gonna take a heavy woven. Let's put a zipper in it. We're gonna use stitch one. We're gonna use a 90 jeans needle, suggestion of a polyester, and we're gonna use the zipper foot. If I choose the green check mark at this point, the machine will close the creative consultant and set me up. If I want to try something different, I can choose a different technique. If I chose the wrong fabric, I can come back up and I can choose the creative consultant, pick a new fabric, pick a new technique, and then pick the check mark. And you'll see that my machine's picked up the zipper foot, has moved my needle, it's adjusted tension, decreased my presser foot pressure, and adjusted my stitch length. All in preparation for sewing that knit fabric and putting in a zipper. Okay, so that's your creative consultant. But again, like I said, this help button works for any screen. So I can hit the help, and I can say, what does this do? This will then give you some basic instructions. It will also allow you to define that icon. So if you wanna open up your owner's manual or do some research, you'll know what Bernina was calling it and not trying to figure it out from the image, okay? Next up is going to be cleaning and maintenancing. So I don't want your machines to look like this, okay? This is dirty, needs to be cleaned, okay? Need to be cleaned long before it came in to be cleaned. You have in your workbooks a section on page 55 about cleaning and maintenancing. You have a section in your owner's manual on cleaning and maintenancing, and we have a section on the machines itself on cleaning and maintenancing, okay? So I'm gonna actually walk you through cleaning and maintenancing a machine. Let's get this down here so that we can see. So on the machine itself for using as reference, we would go to the personal setup on the machine, let's clear this out here. I'm gonna go home. We're gonna let it catch up with itself here. So we're going to, one, we need to disassemble some stuff. So we need to take our bobbins out, we need to take our foot off, we need to unthread our machine, and so on and so forth. When we unthread a machine, we always cut the thread at the top of the machine and pull the remainder through the needle, okay? You do not want to pull thread through the, um, backwards through the machine, okay? That pulls extra uh, lint and thread and stuff in reverse into the machine, and it's just not good for your, for your particular machine. See, there's my Hello Beautiful. Now, <clears throat> okay, we may, there we go. So personal setup, we're gonna go to the machine, we're going to go to the wrench, and the first thing we're gonna do is oil, okay? So when we come in here, this is actually going to shoot, uh, play a little video that you can at any point in time pause, okay? and watch multiple times as it loops through, okay? Now, on the machine itself, what we do is, I'm gonna take my foot off, I'm gonna take out my needle, I'm gonna remove my stitch plate. Pressing down in the upper right-hand corner will pop the front of the plate off, and then you can lift and remove the plate. I'm gonna take out my bobbin, and then I'm going to release the hook, okay? So I'm going to press the latch on the left-hand side 
this race cover is going to drop forward. I'm going to reach in, I'm gonna grab the post in the middle and I'm gonna pull out my hook, okay? So this is your hook. You wanna be careful not to drop this on the ground or anything like that because that is um, very, very important to making a stitch on your machine and it is not a cheap tool, a cheap part to fix. So you would then take your lint brushes and things along that lines and clean and dust from your feed dogs, from behind your hook area and all in this area, okay? Once you have dusted, do not use canned air. Do not blow into the machine with your own spit. You want to use, it could be a very, uh, a lint brush, a paint brush. I have some silicone um, little, like they look like mascara wands that work really well that are washable so that you can clean all the dust and dirt off of them that work really well to get in and pick up um, stray lint. Once you have that clean, the first thing that we're going to do is in your hook, there are two little felt pads, okay? Those are not, these are not lint that's built in here. They're actually a felt pad. And we're gonna put one drop of oil on each one of those felt pads. And then we're gonna come in the machine and we're gonna put a drop of oil at six o'clock. Okay, right on the metal, okay? Remember, your Berninas are metal on metal, so that's why we use oil, okay? <clears throat> Oiling a machine, your machines will actually come up and tell you, but I'm going to suggest that you do it more than what the machine tells you. If your machine is getting what sounds loud, if your machine uh, stitching doesn't look right, it just doesn't sound right, a drop of oil is going to go a long way. You would not run your car without oil. You do not want to run your machine without it, okay? So once we have this cleaned and oiled, we need to get this piece back inside here. Now, <clears throat> the key to this going inside of here, okay, I'm gonna try to bring this down a little bit, is there is a colored dot in here. That colored dot needs to line up with the dot that's in the bottom of the case. Oops. So it needs to line up with this dot here. Now, you can kind of eyeball it, put the t bottom end in first, and get it in here and move it back and forth. The moment you line it up, the magnets will grab it. If that's a challenge, the next way is lay this hook uh, right side down in the race cover, lining up the two dots. And then you should be able to flip it if you've got it lined or right, just right. You'll be able to flip it in place and then lock your latch shut. Now, this is now cleaned and ready to go. <clears throat> we now need to, for those machines that have a um, scissor cutter, we need to clean the what they call a thread catcher, okay? So the thread catcher on the machine is actually this unit. Let me pull the image up for you. It's actually this piece here, okay? So what we do is on the machine, um, <clears throat> you will get every time you turn on the machine, not every time, when you've hit a certain number of thread cuts, the next time you turn the machine on, you're going to get a screen that tells you it's time to clean this. You can hit the green check mark and it will take you to, it'll take you to the screen that will walk you through it. If you don't have time to do it now, you can just hit the X and then you'll get the reminder again when you come up. So what's gonna happen is you're going to t do what it says. You're going to press on the screen um, right where it says move thread catcher out. 
and then you're going to touch the automatic thread cutter button. So that's the button on the head of the machine that you're going to press, okay? So I'm gonna raise this up just a little here so that you can see. So I'm going to, it may take a couple times of touching until you hear the beep, and then I'm going to touch this button. And you're gonna watch, your, the needle bar is gonna come down and this is going to swing over. At this point, you can use a pair of tweezers or your lint brush to clean out any extra um, little tiny thread tails, uh, lint and whatnot out of this thread cutter. When you're all finished, you're going to scroll up on the screen until you get to the section that says move the thread catcher in, touch here, and then touch the button. So I'm going to go to the screen. I'm going to touch the button on screen that says move the thread catcher in. I'm going to hit my scissors, and it's going to go back. Now, at this point, you are done cleaning and maintenancing your machine. You can now put your stitch plate back on, and to put your plate back on, your best bet is to come in, put your plate down into the left, and then snap down on the right, okay? That will secure your stitch plate. You can put your needle back in. Now, I will sometimes, if my machine was super dirty, I will run this, um, machine with no thread, okay? Now, you'll probably get an image on the screen that'll tell you that you don't have any thread in the machine, and that's fine. You just wanna run it a couple of stitches. Just helps to uh, manipulate the oil around the hook. Um, it also helps uh, once I put my bobbin back in and I cut my thread and I rethread the upper portion of my machine, I would then take some scrap fabric. I would stitch a couple lines of straight stitching and zigzag um, before I return to my project, especially if you're working with light colored fabric. This way, if you loosened up any excess dirt or lint or you accidentally got a little too much oil, you'll be able to get that worked out on scrap fabric and not on your good project, okay? Now, I'm going to, um, the thread catcher cleaning is the same on an eight series machine. The only thing different on an eight series machine is gonna be the overall thread um, oiling. So I'm gonna take my bobbin out. I'm going to put my hand underneath of the hook and I'm going to turn the hand wheel keeping the hook from wanting to swing in. And I'm going to do that until I have clear access to behind this silver dot. Now I'm looking at this and my I see a big giant lint ball. Okay so see my machine this is good timing, needs to be oiled and cleaned. So once that is turned, I will then put a drop of oil right behind that um, silver dot. Okay, still see a piece of lint there. Once you have that drop done, then you're going to close the bobbin door let the bobbin case get back into the right position, and then you can reopen and then insert your bobbin in place, okay? The 8 Series machine will not sew without a bobbin in place, okay? And so I would get myself set up, rethread, and then sew a couple of rows of decorative stitching, of straight stitch and zigzag so that I can verify that I have all my lint and everything um, out of the way. Now,
for um, you today. Just a reminder that the tutorials are all built into the machine, just like I walked you through. Um, just a reminder that the Bernina has a series of eBooks available for you to download from their website. So Bernina.com, the top headers, you're gonna find the one that says Learn and Create, and then inside the Learn and Create section, um, you should find the eBooks. It may be under Projects. They, they recently updated the site, and I meant to check this today to make sure this was in the same place. The eBooks are helpful for going into further depth of techniques that I don't always cover 100% inside mastery because I, this could go on for days and hours. Um, so for example, zippers, you have, there's, we don't really cover zipper installation in mastery, but I have an entire ebook available on zipper installation, a machine applique, gathering, all sorts of stuff. So there, all that information is there for you as well that um, can be a lot of help and resources. I think that is probably enough for you today. I appreciate you so much with hanging in here with me. We will be back soon with Sewing Mastery 2 for the same series of machines. We will cover some additional stitch features, combi mode, um, buttonholes and stitch regulation. So we look forward to seeing you soon. Again, if you have any questions, you can post it in the comment section or you can email us at materialgirl at verizon.net. Thank you and have a great day.